Welcome back to Public Finance in Canada. I'm Keith Takucha. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the size and role of government. So we hear it said a lot, hey, government is too big. We prefer a smaller government. Or maybe, hey, we need a larger government. And really, we're going to get at the crux of that argument as to, well, hey, what should the size of the government be? And more importantly, we're not going to really say what the size of government should be. That's a really normative, value-based statement. What we're going to look at is different ways to measure the size of government. We're going to look at some of the difficulties in determining size of government and some of the difficulties in determining maybe what the size of government should be or if we could even measure truthfully the size of government. What we'll also look at, and this goes hand in hand in the size of government, is a discussion as to the role of government. What should the government be involved in? What shouldn't the government be involved in? Uh, what should be their role is it res uh, in respect to society, social issues, and free market issues on whole? So well, let's quickly take a look at just a great little video kind of getting at this idea, and then we'll move on into the size of government. I think that all government is a waste of taxpayer money. My dream is to have the park system privatized and run entirely for profit by corporations like Chuck E. Cheese. New wind blowing in government and I don't like it. And Paul, the city manager, is telling us to build parks, start new community programs. It's horrifying. I like Tom. He doesn't do a lot of work around here. He shows zero initiative. Tom is exactly what I'm looking for in a government employee. Okay, well, that's one view of the size and role of government. Uh, let's carry on and let's take a look at uh, ways that we can determine the size of government. So, first of all, it seems logical almost, and this is the route that many people go, is to, hey, to measure the size of government, let's just look at the number of public servants. How many employees, how many people are hired by government? And this could be either the local, provincial, or federal level. And we can use this as a measure to see, hey, is it a big government or is it a small government? Uh, the other way that logically people jump to to measure size of government would be to look at the number of ministries. So, hey, how many ministries exist or how many departments or how many programs are offered? The more ministries, departments or programs, the larger the government it seems to be, the less, well, the smaller the government. Although it turns out those might not actually be ideal ways to measure the size of government. And let's uh, take a look at an example as to see why that might be the case. So let's imagine two different governments. Let's imagine one, I will call it government A, and let's suppose that it is highly involved in the economy. That is, it's intervening in almost every sector of the economy. And we'll say that the way that it does so is that it actually has a highly advanced artificial intelligence computer. And this highly advanced artificial intelligence computer is able to get into every sector of the economy, have massive influence over the economy, passing new regulations, passing new laws, tweaking little things through its involvement. And really all it needs is one or two guys here. Uh, one or two guys running things and making sure that, you know, what the machine's working properly, maintaining it and analyzing the output. So that is in this government, we have one department or one ministry, right? We could call that the ministry of AI. And in this case here, we just have two public servants, two employees. So that is really in this sense here, this seems like a really small government from those ways that we defined government before. But keep in mind what we had here is we had lots of intervention. That is, we, this government was very involved in the economy, was frequently stepping in on the markets, frequently intervening in the day-to-day -day life of its constituents, of its citizens. So, okay, one government. What about government B? What do we have going on here? Well, in government B, let's say that we have lots and lots of people. So, and these people are grouped together in their departments, in their ministries, or for the programs that they offer. So here we go, here's another ministry, another program, another department. And we'll do one more for good measure here. Uh, we'll say that, well, I'll throw another body in that guy. There we go. So in this scenario, we have lots of people hired, lots of public servants, lots of programs, departments, ministries, however you want to define that. But we'll say that all these public servants are effectively ineffective. 
That is, yes, we have this huge amount of government, we have a lot of people, a lot of departments, but we're not really doing anything. So, lots of department, lots of employees, little to no intervention. Right. So in this case here, we have almost no intervention at all. So here we kind of see this conflicting kind of way in which we could measure government, measure the size of government. If we were to measure the size of government based off of the number of ministries or the number of employees, we would say that this side here, well, this is relatively small. However, over here, if we were to measure it based off of number of employees, number of departments, we would say that this guy is large. On the flip side, however, if we were to measure government size by its degree of intervention in the economy, well, we would say here, lots of intervention. We could say that, hey, this is actually a large government because it's intervening a lot in the free market, in the day-to-day -day lives of its citizens. Where this guy here, this other one, well, we could actually say that this is relatively small. So we see that's actually quite easy to kind of create conflicting descriptions of government based off of this definition. Um, although, yes, it's logically where people jump to when they want to measure size of government, we'll see that it's not satisfactory. Uh, what we will do is we will go and jump and take a look at some common ways. Uh, they're very imperfect. That is, they're only marginally better than what we just looked at, but some common ways in which we can measure the size of the government. And then we'll talk about the problems that exist with them and uh, not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but to realize that there's imperfections in our measurement and to acknowledge those imperfections. Okay, so first, first common way to measure the size of government is to take a look at their expenditure on goods and services. So right, when governments administer their programs, their services, as they go through their ministries, they have things they need to buy, they have new materials, new contractors they need to hire, things they need to build, or just heck even desks and paper and stationery that they need for their office. In this sense here, right, typically we'd say, hey, the greater the expenditure, the greater the size of government. And right in this case here, we'd be talking about greater expenditure either in terms of actual expenditure or expenditure per capita, that is expenditure per person within the area that government's responsible for. So if we're talking about the federal government, that would be government expenditure per person in Canada. Or BC's government, well, that'd be BC's expenditure on goods and services per British Columbia, uh, British Columbian. And in that case there, right, we can see what that per capita spending looks like. So one common way imperfect but common way to measure the size of government. Similarly, we might want to look at transfers. So transfers of income to people, firms, or governments. So really this is from the government to you and I, from the government to different firms, companies that exist, or from one government agency to another. Maybe that's federal to provincial, provincial to local. Um, based off of these degree of transfers, we would again have a notion or an idea as to the size of government. Again, the basic idea here is that the more transfers, the larger the size of the government. More money flowing, larger government altogether is at least the idea of the argument being made here. Finally, well, as government engages in its expenditure, its provision of programs and services, uh, typically one of the ways to fund this is through debt. And so one way to kind of measure, okay, how large is the government is to determine, well, how much money are they paying to service their debt? How much are they paying in interest payments? The more they have to pay to service their debt, well, we could argue the larger that government is. And so altogether, more interest payments, more debt servicing cost, larger government. We'll see, though, that, yes, well, typically we could all agree that, hey, more money being spent is larger government. We'll see that that's not necessarily true. Um, we might actually, in fact, have larger and larger government without a change in the income or expenditure, the amounts that we're looking at here, sorry. 
Uh, very similarly, we could see a rise in the expenditure between purchases of goods and services, transfers, debt payments. And yet we could actually say that the size of the government is shrinking or maybe constant. And let's take a look at what we mean by that. So that is taking a look at some problems in measuring the size of the government. First problem is in accounting costs. And okay, what exactly is going in with accounting costs here? Many things we could take a look at, but one of the big ones that we will is the presence of loan guarantees. So, okay, what's happening with loan guarantees? Let's take a look at a quick example here. Let's say that we have some private firm that wants to start a green energy production. So let's say they wanna create a wind farm. So here we go, here is our windmill, right, as we get our winds, that's gonna spin around, and as it spins around, we generate electricity, and as we generate electricity, yay, we've created green power, the green power gives money back to the investors, and hey, we save the world at the same time. Okay, should be foolproof, should be good to go, but problem with this is, let's say we have our, Fat cat capitalist over here, and we'll give him a little top hat because he's a big fat cat capitalist. He's got all his money, and he's looking to save his capital to put it into something to get a return on investment. And this fat cat capitalist is saying, hey, yeah, 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 I will give you money for your project, but here's the problem. I'm not so sure if this is a good investment. I'm not so sure whether or not you'll actually ever make any money off of this. I'm not really sure if I will get my money back by investing it in you. Due to this risk, due to this uncertainty, this capitalist is going to say, sure, I will give you money. I will invest in your cause, but let's say at something like at a 15% expected return. That is, right, this is going to be the interest rate on your debt. In order to borrow from me, I'm expecting a 15% annual return. Now, all of a sudden, what seemed like a good idea, maybe even a profitable idea, at a 15% interest rate, this is now a no-go. This is now not happening, not capable of happening. Okay, how can we fix this? Well, the government could, and again, this is a possible role of government, government could come in and provide a loan guarantee. That is, we could have our government, we can draw it kind of in our Greco-Roman architecture here, just big building of government. There we go. Government could come in and they could back this loan. And that is essentially they could indemnify the investor from loss. Say, hey, big investor here, you can give the money to this wind farm and we will guarantee that you get your money back. You won't have any risk on it in that sense there. Because, hey, the government, the country, the taxpayer essentially – will indemnify your losses. So in this case, okay, if our losses are indemnified, if our losses are indemnified, we don't need to be witnessing a 15% return on investment anymore to compensate us for our risk. With that risk gone, this investor may now be willing to accept maybe something more realistic like a 3% return on investment. Now at this 3% return on investment, well, now the business owner, the entrepreneur who wants to start this wind farm, they're happy. They get the money they need for their startup. The investor is happy because he gets a solid 3% return. And the government's happy because a social program was satisfied, such as green energy. And all they had to do was guarantee a loan. Now, best case scenario, this whole project here, this whole project is very successful. And there's no issues. That is, money flows back and forth between the firm and the investor, and the government never needs to step in. Right? Let's say that the government underwrote this loan for $1 billion. So yes, the government would have been on the hook for $1 billion if the wind farm had gone south, if it had gone poorly. But in our scenario here, the wind farm went great. So sure, the government put forward, not even put forward, they just said, yeah, we'll cover a billion dollars in the case that it goes bad, but it never did. So in this case here, this billion dollars, it just kind of falls off. We never even need to consider it. But what about the other scenario? What if instead of things going good, 
What if this wind farm turns out to be built in a terrible place? There's not nearly enough wind to generate enough electricity to make a profit or pay back investors. And that is these investors, they start to get angry and they start to go after the government. They start to say, hey, we want our loan covered. This firm is bad. This firm is going bankrupt. It is poorly managed. Well, now, now the government is on that hook for that billion dollars and needs to provide their loan guarantee and step in in the failure of the firm. Okay, where does this all fit into our whole size of government discussion? Well, this fits into the size of government discussion because of rather the arbitrary decision as to how we count this government liability. And yes, I say arbitrary decision. If there's any accountants out there, you're like, no, no, there's a good reason as to why we do it the way we do. And I'm sure there is. But ultimately, these are just lines drawn in the sand. And at some point along the way, there's just had to be lines drawn. It made sense at the time, or maybe in some cases it still does make sense, but it's still an arbitrary line. There's no strong theory or equilibrium or rationale behind it in that sense. So what happens is, do we count this billion dollar loan guarantee as an expenditure for the government? If we answer yes, if we say yes, this is a liability, this is a problem, this is a liability for the government, they might have to pay it. Well, then the government's engaging in lots of expenditure and we would say that, hey, the government would be relatively large in this case because of that expenditure. Alternatively, if we say no, well, if we say no, we're just going to essentially ignore this billion dollar liability. We're going to say that the government never faced that unless they have to. In which case, we're going to say we have a relatively small government. Keep in mind, in both cases, the government's still intervening in the economy. The government's still stepping in as an intermediary, as an indemnitor between a private investor and a private firm. So the intervention is happening either way. But whether or not we count this as towards a large or to ignore it as not part of government or size of government really depends on this arbitrary line drawn in the sand as to how we include this billion dollars. So accounting costs, unfortunately, as they are often arbitrary decisions as to what does and what doesn't get included or how it gets included, this can influence how we have a size of government decision, whether it's large or small. So a problem with that. We also have hidden costs. So one of the big hidden costs that we'll take a look at is the implicit costs of intervention. And to take a look at an example of this, let's talk about regulation. So, okay, government regulation from a budgeting perspective is fairly cheap. You have to pass a law saying what you can and what you cannot do. And then as you pass this law saying what you can and cannot do, you also need to come up with metrics to enforce it. So that is very, very small budget impact. So in that case there, very cheap. And therefore, we would say a hey, small government. But hey, keep in mind, if we have regulations, these regulations are going to go impact the marketplace, impact our economy, and they're going to have distortionary impacts. And these distortionary impacts, these are the implicit costs. So for example, let's take a look at the regulation to mandate seat belts and airbags. And okay, right here, I'm not saying that the regulation to mandate seat belts and airbags is a bad thing. We're just going through this process to explain what ends up happening. So okay, now we have this regulation saying seat belts are mandatory, airbags are mandatory in all new vehicles. Okay, very cheap for the government to do this. But now what does this do? This causes increased production costs. These increased production costs are now going to be borne partly by the producer and lost profits and partly by the consumer and higher prices. So that is we have this flow through effect because a law was passed. We now have less profits. We now have higher prices. And this cost of government intervention is borne by society on whole. And so that's, that's a cost, right? That's something we want to consider as part of government action. And if you wanted to include that, oh, that makes a large government. The more and more interventions they have, the more costs they pass on to society, oh, that's more intervention, more distortions, higher cost, 
larger government. So something we'd want to consider in that, but something that's kind of difficult to work through. Another example, and while we can all kind of get along, along with this, hey, seatbelts and airbags, yes, they're good, and we see the regulation impact and all that. Talk about something a bit more controversial, but really along the same lines is government regulation and healthcare. And in this case here, let's talk about our recent, our recent experiences with our pandemic. So, okay, with the pandemic, it's been fairly well known now that, hey, this mRNA vaccine technology has been sitting on the shelf for a while, waiting to be approved, but keeps running into regulatory hurdles and all of that, right? Given samples that came over from China in the early days of the pandemic, there was actually working prototypes of our vaccine within like months of when it hit North American soil. Right, massively quick, right? Huge mobilization efforts. This was amazing, amazing work of our modern healthcare system, amazing work of modern science to be able to solve this. How come we had to wait months, years before the vaccine actually was available for the vaccine to actually be available to the public? Now, okay, yes, there's supply chain issues in mass producing the vaccine and getting it out and available to everybody, right? That's what we're dealing with predominantly here in BC and even globally as we start taking a look at booster shots, additional, additional, but going way back before that, before the first dose was even available. What was going on? Well, what was going on was regulation. And that is the regulation put into place as to the stringent testing that needs to be done in order to ensure the safety of this vaccine before it can be utilized on mass. Okay, typically we agree, and honestly we should agree that this regulation is a good thing on whole. It prevents a lot of problematic healthcare things coming out, problematic drugs, etc., that may actually cause more harm than good, or may not even cause any good and just be completely inert. And then people are just wasting their money on that. Um, so in that case, there, yes, these regulations are a good thing on whole, but we have to keep in mind that because these regulations were in place, there is an implicit cost. And in this case here, our implicit cost through the pandemic was unfortunately loss of life. Hundreds, if not thousands of lives lost due to the timing in the vaccine rollout. Every day that it took for the vaccine to be approved and rolled out was another life, several lives lost. So, yes, it's a balancing act. Yes, there's something to be had for both sides of that argument. Not saying that the regulation is bad. We're just taking a look at this and we're saying that regulations, government intervention has costs. And in this case here, one of the costs of the regulation on the vaccine on this healthcare market was loss of life, as unfortunate as that is. Does that mean we need to change anything? Not necessarily, right? It doesn't mean the system's broken. It's just recognizing that there is a cost to be had there. Okay, carrying on with our other hidden costs, we also have kind of this uh, fun little thing happening with tax expenditures versus transfers. And let's take a look at what we mean by this. Suppose in scenario A, their BC government, just out of their generosity, we've had a great year. They're going to grant 10% of your income, your taxable income, back to you. So that is, right, in this case here, the government has the money, and they're going to give it back to you, the person. Yay! You get a bunch of money back. So in this case here, let's just say for easy numbers that you have $1,000. That's a funny line. I don't know why he keeps doing that. You have $100,000 of taxable income. The government is going to give you back $10,000 as really just their expenditure. They had collected that. They have all that revenue from different sources, and they're giving $10,000 back to you. Well, in this case, this is going to show up on the government budget as an expenditure. And as it shows up as an expenditure through one of our common ways of measuring the size of government, this would be like, hey, wow, government's expending a lot of money. This is a large government. Ah, maybe that's bad. Maybe that's good, right? Still uh, out, uh, jury's out on that. What about uh, part B? Instead, they're going to provide you a tax credit of $10,000 worth of income. So in this case, we still have our government up here, right? That was up here. Uh, there's our government. And in this case here, yeah, they still have a whole bunch of money. 
But instead of giving it to you, they're saying at tax time, at tax time, when you give us money, you're just going to give us $10,000 less than what you would have normally given us. So if you would have given us $30,000 worth of income tax, we're only going to make that $20,000. We're going to let you keep that $10,000. So in this case here, we're just changing the tax rate essentially, but we see that really the end result is the exact same to you and I in the bottom. Here we get given 10,000, here we just get to keep an extra 10,000. We don't have to give it back, right? In this case here, we still gave the government our full 30 worth of taxes. In this case, I only had to give the government 20 in taxes. I gotta keep this 10,000. So hey, it worked out the same way, no matter which way we looked at it, we're still just as well off. What are we getting at? What's the point of this? Well, the point of this is that, hey, scenario A, we would be counting this as an expenditure. We would be saying, hey, more expenditure, larger government. In scenario B, this is not showing up on the budget. This is not part of government expenditure. This is not part of their programs. This is not part of anything we would look at in that sense. So it would not show up. We would say government size has not changed. We would miss this altogether. So again, one of our imperfections due to the way we measure things. So again, the whole point of this is to show that yes, there are ways to measure the size of government. There's common ways to do it, such as looking at government expenditure transfers and debt servicing costs. But we need to recognize that these are imperfect measures. They don't capture everything and we need to recognize that. Let's move on. Let's talk about the role of government. So we've said at minimum, the role of government is to kind of maintain this monopoly of violence. Ideally, they maintain that monopoly of violence underneath the rule of law and through the enforcement of property rights. Here, this isn't really any way that we can actually say with certainty, yes, the government should do that. No, the government shouldn't do that. That's why we have different political parties of various different political stances, getting at how involved the government should be on whole. Uh, there's a lot of political theory as to right, what the role of government should be, what services, what at minimum should be provided. We're not going to get into that. We're just going to have this as kind of an open discussion. Starting us off, kind of that first kind of thinking point is, hey, should the government exist at a bare minimum to ensure our safety and protection of rights? That is, right, that bare minimum as we talked about, monopoly of violence, rule of law, property rights, we're safe, we're protected. Outside of that, go at it. Invisible hand of the market will guide everything else. As long as you're safe and protected by the government, uh, you're free to do what you want. Is that, is that a good role of government or do we expect more from our governments? And if we do expect more from our governments, what should we expect? Right? And this is where we're going to get into varying different views of belief as to, hey, we should expect X, Y, Z, or we should expect A, B, C, on and on and on. But some thinking points with this. Should the government enact notions of fairness? So that is what we each have access to. Uh, one of the big things that comes up on this is things like smoking bylaws. Do I have the right to free air? Or not free air, do I have the right to clean air? Or do you have the right to smoke? Right, who's fair, what's fair in that situation? Is it fair for you to be able to smoke in public and be able to enjoy that? Or is it fair for me to be able to enjoy clean air? Between two individuals, probably not going to come up with a solution. Role of government to come in and determine what is fair, whether it's fair to be able to utilize a certain good or service. In this case here, we're talking about tobacco, uh, whether that be e-cigarettes, cigarettes, etc. Or was it fair to be able to have access to clean air? Big debate with that, of course. There's no clear answer. Different jurisdictions, different regions have come to different outcomes on that. But notions of fairness. Should the government get involved in order to dictate what is or is not fair? What about economic outcomes? So, right in this case here, we have situations like um, the Trans Mountain Pipeline, TMX. Um, Government went in and bought this pipeline, made it happen, brought everything through to ensure that it happens when this was a private company. 
right? This was a private firm trying to be profit maximizing, doing its own private stuff. And yet we had government public funds coming in to see it through one way or another. Should the government be concerned with these private economic outcomes? If so, to what extent? Should the government be concerned in ensuring that we have steady supply of oil from overseas? Should the government be concerned in making sure that certain other goods, maybe food, are available to us day in and day out? Big things here, private markets would take care of them on their own. Are we satisfied with that private outcome or do we need government intervention? And to what degree and who, which market should the government intervene for? Which market should they not? Big questions to be had there. What about notions of equality? Uh, in this case here, we can talk about income equality. So with income equality, should we all be earning roughly the same? Will, are we willing to embrace a level of inequality? If we are willing to embrace a level of inequality, what is that degree of inequality that we're okay with? What stories are we willing to tell ourselves to justify a degree of inequality? Does the government have a role to play in ensuring that this is one way or the other? Um, so I just want to back up there quickly. This just came to my mind. Back to economic outcomes. What we can also talk about with this is, yeah, we talked about, hey, stepping in for the Trans Mountain Pipeline, bringing that in or other projects and making sure that they happen or don't happen. Other things we have to think about with this too is role of government in ensuring the social outcomes of those projects. So this could be things like jobs, livelihoods, all of that. And also the other side of that, and entwined with the social aspect is the environmental aspect. Should the government have a role to play in either of these? Or is this the private realm, the private sphere, the role of you and I and families in order to figure this out? Some big questions to be asked. Along the lines of income equality, we can similarly ask about wealth equality. So, okay, income is how much money you earn day to day to day. Wealth is how much, well, wealth, how much uh, value you have stored up. Uh, in this case, here we can say how much money you have stored up, your stock of money. Uh, do we accept that there's a massive deviation in wealth equality, that we have multi-billionaires and we have people with negative net worths? Uh, to what extent of wealth inequality are we okay with? Do we care? Is there a role of government to step in and influence our degree of wealth equality, wealth inequality? Similarly, what about consumption equality? Right? In this case here, we see often this uh, statement coming out. Housing is a right. Right? In this case here, what they're getting at is that irrespective of one's income, irrespective of one's wealth, they should have a right to shelter, a right to housing, and that is the consumption of shelter and housing. Uh, do we want to make sure that everybody has roughly equal access to these goods that we deem necessary for life? Um, as a society, we have deemed that everybody should have equal access to education, at least through the K through 12 years. That's ensuring consumption equality of education. Come the post-secondary level, we are willing to accept a degree of inequality. However, there's still government intervention in order to ensure it's not too unequal. Where's our line there? To what degree are we willing to accept consumption equality versus consumption inequality? So again, value-based things as to how we think the government should step in, what role the government should play in fixing these kind of social problems. Another big thing to think about with this is how does this change if we're talking about local government versus provincial versus federal, right? Do we have different values as to how big or how involved different levels of government should be on different points that we brought up here? Finally, what about the provision of some goods and services? So just for a quick example, let's talk about infrastructure. Technically, we could outsource infrastructure to private firms, have all bridges, tunnels, overpasses, roads be built by private firms, and have them be tolled. So, hey, you need to pay a toll every time you travel over it. Could happen. We could do that. Uh, do we want that as a society, though? What about other services, such as, like we already talked about, education, health care? Should we expect the government to provide those, or should we expect the private market to provide those? Other goods such as parks. 
to a degree, parks can be privatized. If you allow people to have larger, uh, larger land, larger properties, you can kind of substitute public parks for larger backyards. Are we okay with that? Is that what we'd prefer? Or we prefer maybe smaller yards, larger public parks? What is the trade-off to be had there? What is the role for government with this respect? Um, we can carry on beyond this, right? Public swimming pools, public gyms, public golf courses. All of these things are able to be provided by the private sector. Is there a role for government to provide these? And if yes, at what level of government should this be taking place at? So again, there's not necessarily a distinct answer to any of these. These are primarily talking points to think about the role of government and to think about, hey, what should the federal government be doing at certain levels? What should the provincial government, what should the local government be doing at different levels? Great. That does us for talking about the size and role of government. We've taken a look at the common three ways of measuring size of government. That is amount on expenditures, amount on transfers, and amount on debt servicing. We talked about the problems in measuring it that way. Not to toss the baby out with the bathwater, but to recognize the issues that exist. We then brought up some discussion points about the role of government and just to kind of get some creative juices thinking as to where, where our take is as to what government should and should not be doing with respect to markets. Should you have any questions from anything in this video, please feel free to comment below. Please feel free to send me an email or of course, feel free to post onto the D2L frequently asked questions. Where are we going from here? From here, the next set of videos are going to be taking a look at welfare economics. So kind of creating this idea as to how we can maximize social benefits, social welfare. From that, we're going to take a look at a decision rule, how to figure out, hey, which projects we should, which projects we shouldn't be taking a look at. And if we have competing projects, how do we choose A over B or alternatively B over A? So that's where we're going to go next. I'll take us through the next few weeks. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.